Hi, my name is Tina Rosa, and I've lived in Deadwood for 35 years. And in the introduction, you said that some things were unknowable, that we could not know how long we had been exposed. And I beg to differ. I moved here in 76, and as far as I know, in 1975, Citizens Against Toxic Spray, CATS, brought to the public's attention the devastating impact of these sprays on birth defects, spontaneous abortions, and dead babies. Okay, that is a long time ago. So I know how long we've been exposed. I don't know why you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is entirely possible that exposures have gone on longer than even you know. Oh, I believe it. And I want to say I'm very grateful, very, very grateful to see and hear impassioned younger people continuing this fight. We're not going to give up. No. Okay, so if it's determined that the test results show uh, chronic exposure above an acceptable level, which you've already explained, uh, could be done. Um, but as you explained in your PowerPoint, health effects are unknowable from this type of chronic exposure. What specific action, if any, does each agency have the power to take? So I'd just like to hear what each agency can do, if anything if we end up with positive results from this study. Well, I can speak, I'll, I'll start for health, and then we'll kind of move on from that. So what health has the ability to do is to um, uh, use the data to assess whether or not the exposures that we think could be happening are above an acceptable level, and make recommendations to the agencies that regulate those uh, agents to um, uh, and engage in a process to reduce those potential exposures. And we, we heard about some of them tonight. Uh, we've, heard, we've heard a few different ways, but health ability is to make the assessment of is it happening oh, and what's the, what's the potential risk. So you can make that recommendation even not knowing if there are health effects from the chemicals? Is that what you're saying? Right, because we use uh, theoretical risk, which is now sort of unsatisfying. But uh, based on um, risk, risk assessments and risk calculations, we use those models to, uh, based on animal studies, the, the health impacts be. And that's specific for atrazine and 2,4-D? <coughs> Correct. And actually for the others. It's more than, uh, we, can, we can make those calculations for more than just atrazine and 2,4-D. Okay. And then each other, each agency beyond that? Um, I talked about that already. Uh, you know, we get information from the field. We're kind of the eyes and ears of EPA headquarters for pesticide regulation. We get incident information, exporting information that gets fed back into uh, evaluation of that chemical. Is it um, impacts the food intended? And if so, then there are measures I can take in the pesticide. Okay, sorry. A pesticide could be uh, phased out, it could have use restrictions put on it, it could, you know, the label could have precautions to not apply in this particular manner. So that's how EPA would address a risk of pesticide. If we have enough good scientific information showing that there are risks, then we take it into account in, in the marketplace by putting restrictions on it. But do you think that, I'm talking about this specific study, but do you think that that could happen from this specific study with 40 families, that, or 36 people, actually? I, I'm just wondering, yeah, what that, can you really you do know, I can't that? sit here and promise you that. No, no, Your I know. Study I'm just wondering. Your change of a dozen pesticide labels, but it will, it will go into the body of knowledge about the chemicals that we're going to look at. Uh, ETSDR, Richard, do you want to take a step? Well, yeah. We're, as a public health agency, we're going through the same process as the Oregon Health Authority. And as I indicated earlier, we provide them funds to support us in this type of work, so we'll rely on them for the risk assessment piece of this. One of the things that ETSDR can add to this is that we have a potential issue of public health advisory. Um, if the, the data is compelling and it shows that there is significant risk to the community, 
it is within the power of ATSDR to issue uh, a strongly worded letter to the administrative EPA to take action. That's pretty much the extent of our um, power. We we're essentially a non-regulatory advisory agency. Um, but usually when ATSDR issues a public health advisory, it's taken very seriously by EPA and, and generally actually uh, the result from that. Well, he's, he's got the I got the mic. Yeah. Uh, you are not going to be satisfied with this answer. <laughs> um, I do not have any authority to take action in regards to public health. Um, I have authority to take action to protect public resources. There is a nexus for public health that I have to protect water, drinking water, and DEQ's clean water standards. So I have to meet OHA's drinking water standards, and I have to meet um, DEQ's uh, clean water standards. That's where my authority stops. And so I know that's been frustrating with the group coming to the Board of Forestry. They've been asking the Board of Forestry to react to public health advisory things. And that's done through the EPA as the primary agency for regulating public health and ODA's pesticide regulation. So um, we will listen to whatever changes come and implement those changes by the agencies that have the authority to do that. Are those all the agencies represented? Uh, agriculture has a spoken. From agriculture standpoint, the information, and I'm speaking specifically in regards to the Pesticide and Local Response Center, that is a board that can make recommendations for change based on the findings of information such as this study. So that is the avenue. That information can also be shared with U.S. EPA, and uh, that is how the change is brought about. So, with, I'm sorry, which department again? Oregon Department, department of, Agriculture. of Agriculture. Can you make forestry decisions, though? No. The Pesticide Analytical Response Center is housed within the Oregon Department of Agriculture. I see. Multitude of, of agencies coming together, they can make recommendations for change to be brought about based on findings such as this in the study. I think there's yeah. another part of that. We, we have to follow a EPA and uh, Oregon Department of Agriculture laws when pesticides are applied. So if there's any change in the pesticide laws, if the pesticide's banned, it automatically applies to forestry. So if uh, atrazine was banned, it would no longer be used in forest. By, that, that's what gives the authority to use it in forestry. So it isn't that ODA would make a forestry law, they make a pesticide law, and then we would enforce that on forest land. Is okay. that clear? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, so basically the person who has, or the agency that has to make the decision is the EPA then for anything to really happen from this, is that correct? And would that be an Oregon division of the EPA or a state division, or sorry, or a federal division? On a national yeah. level, U.S. EPA would be making decisions. The Pesticide and Local Response Center can mm -hmm. make a recommendation for changes uh, within pesticide regulation within the state of Oregon. Mm -hmm. Okay, but so if that recommendation is made, I'm sorry, I just want to see okay. how something could potentially come of this should there be chronic unacceptable levels found of these compounds. So if something were to happen and the, uh, how's it go, packed or whatever? Park. 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 Uh, was uh, made a recommendation that these chemicals, let's say, should that the application method should change. Let's say we use that as an example. So then that recommendation would be made, and what chain would that have to go through to actually get something to happen? My, my understanding is that federal law is applies as a baseline. And my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is that federal law applies as a baseline, and states can enact further laws that are more restrictive. More protective. Mm -hmm. So I guess there are two avenues, really. Um, okay. Thank you very well much. Well said, Sujan. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Greg, you want to? Oh, sorry. But Thank you. Yeah, you. Something that, <laughs> sorry, one more. Well, Oh, you know, my answer is probably not going to be satisfactory either. I think the important thing to understand is it's not whether pesticides are detected or not, whether they be in urine or in water, because we're going to detect them. 
When I started in this business, we were looking for things in the part per million range. Now we're looking for things in the part per trillion range. As we've lowered the detection limits down to these really small levels, we're finding a lot more stuff in a lot more places. And eventually, we'll get to the point where we can find just about everything in just about anything. So really the question is, has there been some kind of an established threshold exceeded? That's going to be the real question. Mm -hmm. And that's the most difficult part of this assessment. It's not whether or not there's some kind of exposure occurring, but what does that exposure mean? Mm -hmm. And we need to have criteria or benchmarks or some kind of a guidance number upon which to go there. So for DEQ, for example, we establish water quality standards. So if our water quality standards for either surface water or groundwater were exceeded in, by these concentrations, then there was a number of things that would be implemented as a result of that water quality exceedance. But simply finding these, pre these compounds in the water would not necessarily by itself trigger a regulatory response. What if you found them in the air? Even less authorities there for air. We don't really have uh, air toxic standards for most things. We have some uh, air toxic benchmarks, which are not regulatory guidelines. So it would be a, it would be a more difficult thing in that particular case. I would say it would really be the health risk that would drive any kind of a follow up action. And so then, if these are only found in people's urine, for example, and uh, and because you don't know if you're going to be able to do the air study or not, you know, whether or not that will happen, at least that's what I've heard so far. If they're only found in people's urine, what is the likelihood that, or what likely thing is going to happen if they're above what uh, the 95th percentile and the, the kind of estimated so-called safe level? It, would that be determined as a so-called safe level, the 95th percentile that was mentioned earlier? Or can you really make a health recommendation for something that you've already explained has unknowable health risks? I think I've got it. Um, okay. If I would say that the, the exceeding of the threshold of the comparison group is probably one of the key triggers of, of something happening because this is an exposure investigation. This is about what is actually getting into people and you know, are we seeing levels of concern in, in people? So, and was that, that you were asking about the 95th percent? I'm just asking then, so can you really do something? So, and because of the way that we work, we would then make recommendations. Make ATSDR would make recommendations. We would make recommendations. And okay. that, that's how it functions. Well, thank you for explaining that. I'm not trying to pick you guys apart. No. We're all just trying to figure out what the correct line of um, you know, taking this is. So thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.